Hello and welcome to the Audulous live stream uh, tutorial. Today we're going to talk about this new semi-modular synthesizer called the Curvature Micro. And the Curvature is, Micro is a smaller version of a much larger synthesizer. I might as well just go ahead and show you why I made this smaller version. I have this larger one. This is basically, this back here is the Micro. And that's the heart of this synthesizer that has been taken out basically like right here and you can hear it starting to fade up the reason I did this this is like a learning synthesizer for people who already know about synthesis but want to get to know modular synthesis and it's got a bunch of different functions and things to do and I talked about it in the last live stream a bit um, but this is quite a more complicated beast than uh, the absolute beginner would necessarily want to dive into uh, so I decided to strip something back to a smaller synthesizer, and let's go back here. This is the the core. Uh, it's got a wave shaping portion here, and a subtractive synthesis portion. So we'll go over what those mean uh, in a second here. But I just want to you know, hear. I, I have a little keyboard in front of me. You can hear it playing sounds. And it's got these this two convenient modes where if, if you have it selected like this, where the keyboard is showing, you can just pl plug in a keyboard to your iOS device through a uh, a MIDI, um, sorry, a, a camera connector kit. And what I use is the Keith McMillan QNexus, which is a great portable um, lightweight keyboard, kind of perfect for iOS stuff. Uh, and you know, you just plug that right in and you turn it so that you can see the keyboard here, because if it turn it off, you can't see the keyboard. If you turn that on, you can see the keyboard and you can play it. And you don't you can just load this up and you don't have to patch anything else. You just have a one knob per function uh, synthesizer here. And if you want to uh, use external effects before, you know, if you wanted to add a delay or something, uh, you, you turn this volume knob all the way down and then the audio gets routed here. You can see you can kind of see it flashing out there. Then you could, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but how you can pull uh, an effect, like a delay or a reverb or something there. So for now, let's um, let's talk about what this synthesizer is. So it's a subtractive synthesizer. And what I did here was I, I built a little, um, a little diagram of what it looks like on the inside. Because right now, if I if I double click on the inside and go here, it all looks kind of like a mess. This is kind of hard to understand what's going on, and it's I'm going to clean it up, and it's going to look a little neater and have a little node by node description of what's going on. But I wanted to just jump in and give a quick rundown of how this this thing works before uh, you know time gets away. So right here we can see where the the keyboard external pitch. So there's a switch where you know you either keyboard or external, and this external. That would be, you have the pitch coming in here and the gate coming in here. So that pitch signal goes to three three VCOs. Or basically, this one, the, these two VCOs are the same. They're wave shaping, and they morph from sine to square. And then they get pan mixed together. That means that they you pan between one and the other. Uh, it's sort of like crossfade, but it keeps the volume equal between the uh, oscillators when you're panning them. And then this sub down here gets half panned, which means that uh, you know you can pan so that there's no sub going at all and just go straight through. Or that you have like a half mixture of half sub and half this mixture here. But it won't go to all sub. So what's nice about the pan though is that you, you'll see later when you turn the pan up, you uh, don't get this uh, increase in volume because it's automatically compensating by turning this portion down. Uh, so you don't have to adjust the volume. Same thing with here where, uh, or actually th this is a little different where it's, it's panning all the way from this to the white noise. So you could just have white noise coming in or just the oscillators. And then once th this all gets mixed down, they have a drive control that adjusts the amount of gain uh, or the level of the signal that's going from here to the VCF. And the reason for that is because you can get some, if you crank the drive control, then you can get some nice distortion from here. Uh, if you turn the distortion back, the drive back, then you'll get a much more pronounced uh, resonance Q factor um, from it. 
So then it goes from the VCF to the VCA to the output. And that's a pretty simple, uh, uh, very familiar structure where you have VCO to the VCF to the VCA. The VCF is the voltage controlled filter. Um, I'm calling it a VCF. There's really no voltage here, but uh, that's something that people are familiar with. And it's a LPF or low pass filter. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Then VCA is a voltage controlled amplifier. And the, it's basically, you have this keyboard, the gate, the gate signal. Uh, that's, that's just when the note is pressed. There's a little gate that comes out. And then it triggers this envelope to go and modify the cutoff point of this filter. And then the VCA uh, will modify this one. And I actually forgot. Uh, this actually, the synthesizer has a unique function um, where what it does is it also has a, uh, a mixer between, how does this work? Yeah, it'll be like this. So there's some FMing or frequency modulation on the cutoff point and sorry about that. So this sub oscillator comes down here and this VC, VCF envelope is mixed into here. And, uh, whoops, <laughs> I'm messing this up. I should have thought about this a little more before I had it uh, up. But basically this, this pin little pan control here, this pans between all envelope and all sub oscillator. So you can see the sub oscillator uh, is modifying the cutoff and filter point here. And we'll, we'll hear what that sounds like in a second. Uh, so sorry about that. Th this will, when I, when I upload the patch in the forum, this will have a uh, more complete um, diagram for you to look at so you can understand what's going on. Uh, so it basically pans between these two. I don't know why I had a second one in there. It's really like this. Okay. So this this allows the filter if it's self oscillating which means it's kind of just resonating and creating an oscillating tone uh this can be clamped down by the vca so it, you won't hear if if the vca was before the vcf then you would hear this whistling tone goes afterwards and finally there's the output and you have this volume volume knob here when the knob is greater than zero it goes to the audio output just like you're hearing now but when like i showed you before when you turn the knob all the way down it goes to the front panel patch point and that's where you see all of these, these front panel patch points all over. These are these points here, 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 here. And the other thing we have is we can take this gate that goes out to the front panel patch point and there's a reset point that comes in here. And this is the LFO and sample and hold. And these uh, shapes is a triangle, inverse triangle, sine and random, and they all go at the same speed so you only have one speed control, but you have an attenuator and offset so you can kind of scale the response of those LFO and sample and hold. You do a lot of different things with this. Uh, but what makes this a semi-modular uh, is that you're able to have these little patch points and you draw little things out and can uh, have different modulation points there. And th this is different than most synthesizers where you would just have access to just the controls on the front panel. So now that we understand that signal flow, I'll go over it again. We have the, uh, the keyboard pitch gets sent to the VCOs, and these are kind of like the voice of the, the voice of the synthesizer. It's mixed between this, this VCO and this VCO. And then this mix is half mixed with the sub oscillator here. Then this stuff, everything here, is then mixed between the this and the white noise. There's a drive control to adjust the amount of distortion that's going into the VCF, and then the VCA, and then out. And then you have the gate from the keyboard that's triggering the envelope, which, which is triggering the cutoff of the VCF, and it's also uh, triggering the VCA envelope, which is triggering the volume of the synthesizer it's passing through. And then it also, you have two patch points where one's an inverted output and one's a normal output, normal inverted. And then that's regular. And then you have the LFO, which you can use for modulation. So now that we know how it works on the outside, uh, we'll zoom in here. And 
this is the default. And uh, what's nice about this is that although we, we don't have um, we have presets yet, that's going to be an Oculus 4 feature. Uh, I'm going to make a whole folder of you know preset sounds that are all kind of dialed in, ready to go for people who just want to pull them up and start playing. And what uh, what you can do is you just change so uh, square lead. If I change that, I can make this a square lead. And I would save this and upload so the form as the square lead. So that's just something to, to note there. Then we have the title of the module here, the curv curvature micro. And then the VMS20 is indicating the filter that's underlying here. I'm going to make some other additions where there's an, uh, a modeled SEM filter and a modeled uh, Moog low pass filter. Uh, these aren't officially endorsed, but they're based off of white papers that people have uh, read online. And so I just, uh, this is my favorite one, so I always start uh, with this one first. But you know you can the, the filter changes a lot of the characteristics of the sound, so it would be cool to be able to uh, change between the different ones. So uh, as you can see, what one of the priorities of the synthesizer is the low CPU usage. It's basically hovering about nine, ten percent on my Mac Mini, uh, and I, I pulled it up on my iPhone uh, Seven Plus, and it was up to maybe thirteen percent. Uh, and so it will definitely it'll run maybe on an iPhone Five S around. 40%, 30%, something like that. I'm just uh, guessing here. Uh, but the idea being that this is a small, lightweight synthesizer that you can use. It also is analog sounding and fat and has a lot of cool options that, you know, still not limiting in any way. Um, so we'll take a tour of the controls. We'll start with the oscillator first. And the oscillator is basically this section right here. And that, that's considering that here's oscillator one, oscillator two, the sub oscillator, and the noise and all of those controls around it. So you can see here, you can morph between, I'm gonna pan all the way over to this first oscillator. I'm gonna open the filter all the way up. Uh, turn the Q down, open the envelope up. Okay, so we're in sine wave right now. And you can morph between sine, triangle. You can see it's indicated by the little blue light there. And then saw. And square. And you can you know, pick your waveform here and then you can actually pick another wave from here on this oscillator. And, do that. and then morph between the two. So that's that section where you can change the shape of the wave this for the first oscillator, for the second oscillator. And you can change the balance, the pan between oscillator one and oscillator two. And you can tell that the green lights indicate the relative uh, volume of each of these. Now, the other unique thing about this synthesizer, this oscillator, is the shape control. And normally, you just uh, on the oscillator node, you just have a shape control for the uh, saw and the square. And <laughs> sounds there. And for the square, this is the pulse width. You can see if you look at this little icon here, that kind of illustrates what it's doing. It's going between half on, half off to like mostly on, mostly off, or a little bit off. So if you turn it up, it gets readier. Almost like there's a high pass filter on it. And you can do some cool things when you have, you know, if you're on the same shape, but you can mix between the two at different pulse widths.
So it's a way to sculpt your tones uh, really precisely like that. And now moving on to this control here, this is the relative detune. So this will this will push, as I turn this up, this will push this oscillator sharp, and it'll push this oscillator, oscillator flat for a total of one, um, one semitone in either direction. And you, you hear it's, it's a really cool effect. Uh, it's almost like a chorus sound, especially when it's on the squares. Compare that to. Pretty, pretty extreme here. And because it pushes this sharp and this flat at the same uh, rate, it, it doesn't really change the overall perceived pitch because they kind of pull uh, each other back to the bass pitch so, so you don't have to retune it uh, with another master um, control. However, you do want to be aware that if you have the detune up like this, this will register as to the, the ear and to a tuner is, is more sharp. This will be more flat. So it really only uh, it only stays perfectly in tune if you have it right up in, up the middle. And what's great about this control too is that when you turn it all the way down to zero, it resyncs the oscillators automatically. And what that means is that basically when the oscillators are going uh, out of speed with each other or out of phase, they'll sound different when they come right back into the same frequency if they're not reset from the beginning of their waveform. And so this is a way to get a consistent sound when you turn the detune off. Get a nice, uh, this also is scaled in a way where there's a, between here and here, uh, there's smaller, small steps of detune. And then between here and here, there are much larger steps in detune. So you can, you can just have a, just a little bit and it'll kind of evolve over time. waves like beat against each other. Alright, now we'll get onto the sub oscillator. So that's right here. Actually, uh, I skipped over this control here. This is the uh, tune for this oscillator, the second oscillator. And this is in tune with uh, the base oscillator, oscillator 1. And then I can also shift it all the way up an octave. that too. And what's nice to hear, you don't always have to have it all the way up for an octave, but you can tune it to intervals. So this sounds like a, if you have it mixed straight up the middle like this, it makes it sound like a uh, it's not a chord, but it's whatever when, whatever it's called when you play two notes at once. So I think a chord is three or more uh, notes. But you can kind of fake a, a duophonic sound, because really this is a monophonic synthesizer. Uh, you can fake a duophonic sound like that. Or you can, if you adjust the balance, you can make this sound more like an overtone of the original synth uh, original oscillator. So if you have this tuned down a little bit, then you're not really perceiving this oscillator as its own separate note. It's more like an, an aspect of this sound. And it'll be more pronounced if I go, say, here to the... And I 
apologize. I'm really not that great of a like, keyboard player, so I know this isn't necessarily the most entertaining stuff to listen to. <laughs> but he's getting an idea of what it sounds like. So uh, going back, uh, I realized I didn't cover the shape controls for the sine and the triangle. Um, so this is sine, and this shape control for sine, there isn't really one that's built into the oscillator. If we go into here, this is the inside of the oscillator before it's been cleaned up. But this this little shape input only affects the saw and the uh, square at the moment. But right now I have it rigged up so that this is fading between. For the sine, there's a wave folder here. It's a wave folder expression. And it's basically taking the sine of the sine wave that has been multiplied by some factor and it kind of folds the wave over and makes it more harmonically rich. And it, it's almost like an instant FM sounding tone to it, uh, frequency modulation. And then for the triangle wave, there is a hypertangent or like kind of a, it's a one expression semi tube like overdrive for uh, Audulus. And that's the hypertangent tan H. And it just multiplies the triangle wave by 10, and then you can crossfade between the un, uh, undistorted and distorted signals. And what this does is it kind of makes it more square wave like, uh, it distorts it, adds more harmonics to it basically. It makes a richer sound. So we'll pop back out. That's the pure sine tone. So adding more. Almost becomes metallic at this point. Sounds pretty cool when you modulate it like that. So and then here's the triangle. Pure triangle. So just a little fatter. This it's more subtle for the, the triangle, but it can help fatten up a, a sound a lot. Okay. So we've gone over the shape of the oscillator, the balance of oscillator one and two. Uh, the uh, individual kind of pulse width or you know shapes of each oscillator and I also didn't notice um, or note when this is all the way down it's blue here and when it's all the way up it's uh, pink so that's just another visual indicator there then we go over the detune between the oscillators and we went over to the tune for the second oscillator here that's a unison, octave up. Then now we can talk about the sub oscillator. And so you can hear how this is a pretty thin sounding patch. It's nice harmonically. But if you want to add a little lower end to it, a little kind of thickness to the sound, a sub oscillator that's a sine wave is a good way to do that. And you'll notice that the this balance right here got quieter as I turned this up. So the overall level of the synthesizer doesn't really change. I usually like it up, you know, straight up the middle or a little bit up here. It sounds more hollow. It's more substantial. Okay. And then we get to the noise. And we turn, fade this up. Start to hear that little tss, tss kind of sound to it. And then this is a half and half balance of all of this oscillator stuff going on here and the noise. 
but then you can actually go all the way to the noise. And this is useful if you want to uh, make a, say like a hat sound with, with the synthesizer. And if I turn this down. And it's really nice if you if you just add a little bit of noise. So this is without noise. Let's see. I have a little bit. So you can see, usually to make it sound a little more analog sounding, less, less digital and clean, you can add a little bit of noise to dirty it up a bit. Okay, so now we've done that. Let's see. I'm gonna... We can move on to the drive control. So again, this is all pretty much the oscillator controls right here. Oscillator 1, oscillator 2, the mix between these two, the detune, the shape controls for each oscillator here, the tune control for this oscillator, the sub oscillator, the noise, and now the drive. So, drive control obviously makes it louder. Turn it up this way. You can hear it distorting, and you can actually see it distorting right there. softer and you'll hear you don't hear the difference so much other than it sounds you know louder more distorted this way this is softer but if I bring up the Q this is the resonance basically self resonating at this point here I can turn this up peak of that filter will sound a lot more apparent when the drive is down than when it's up. So this is, it's almost so loud that you only hear that little whist, whistle kind of noise from the filter here. And if you keep turning it up, then you'll almost hear only all tone. extra kind of tone control that you have over here. Now, this is a, it's purely from like a design perspective, but it doesn't really show the underlying architecture. Usually when you design a synthesizer, you want it to be, you know, uh, basically top, bottom, left, right. So this is the oscillator section. And then you'd expect the next one in the signal chain to be uh, the VCF right here. But I just liked it with having the two envelope controls next to each other like this. And so I put the VCA over here, the VCA envelope over here, and the VCF filter over here, the VCF uh, envelope over here. So even though it goes from the oscillators to the filter to the VCA, uh, it's more useful to me to have them right next to each other so you can kind of eyeball them and compare them. Because imagine if this was all the way on the other side of this, it would be harder to look at the um, the different attacks and compare them to each other. So you can tell we have two um, displays right here, and this is a zero and this is one. So uh, when the VCA is multiplying the output of the oscillator and the filter, right now it's multiplying it by zero. You can actually go inside and look at that. So this is the this is the actual like VCA module, uh, as it would be if you had it in your your system. It's just a multiply node. And then this is the envelope. And again, this is all kind of messy and unfiltered. So this is as it comes out of the filter, and right before it goes to the output. So that's time zero, 
times one. And if you want to make a sound that's more smooth and fading in, you can uh, increase the attack. You want to have like a longer release. You hear that kind of... Uh, I want the, the filter to kind of match it. Maybe have the filter take a little longer to get up to its height and fade out too. What's really cool about this little control down here, so this is a, this adjusts the maximum time for, and maximum meaning if it's all the way up here, for the attack, decay, and release portions. The sustain is just a, a level that it sustains to, so if I hold the key down, this is the level that it's sustaining to. If I, if I let go and do that again, it sustains higher. It's lower. So if I want to keep the ratio between all these controls the same, but I just want to kind of change the time of the, a, uh, the ADR portions, I can turn this down. You can even do really long, really long ones like this. These are great for drone pads. So when I let go, it's going to the release portion, so that'll take you know 20 total seconds for it to fade all the way out for the uh, BCF there. So if you want to make a really kind of plucky sound, usually have the attack lower than the... Uh, it, it doesn't do much good to have the VCF uh, attack lower than the this attack, unless you want to make that kind of sound. I don't know, that's that's not as common of a sound where the filter kind of peaks before it's gotten all the way up to its maximum height. It's something you can do, but uh, this is much more common. It's kind of a, a plucked sound. And to get a really um, percussive filter sound, you just turn the attack down. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to these uh, outputs here, but you can see there if I, it goes all the way up to 60 seconds and then all the way down to 0.5. This might be more suitable for like making percussive sounds. I just want to really, uh, it's almost like a rim shot sound. Okay. Okay, now that we're on to, we got the envelopes for the VCA and VCF, even though it goes from oscillator to VCF, to VCA, then to the output, um, just so we can have them next to each other and compare the envelopes. Move on to the filter now, and there are these filter controls here. There's typical, the, the cutoff of the filter. And this just means that the, the filter in here is modeled after the filter that's in uh, the Korg MS-20, and it's a really kind of squelchy filter that's really famous and sounds really good. And it's got this frequency range. It goes from 50 hertz to 15K, and that's 15 kilohertz. And you can see that this isn't going up at a linear pace. You know, if it was going up linear, it'd be 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. It's increasing with every little uh, uh, impulse there. And that's, that's because the way that our ears hear frequencies uh, isn't linear. Uh, so as you go up an octave, 
the frequencies are doubled and they're they're doubled to the next octave so if you go from 100 hertz to 200 hertz that's one octave but then 200 to 400 is another octave and then 400 to 800 is another octave so between 400 and 800 is 400 hertz but between uh, 0 or sorry 100 and 200 is just 100 hertz so you can see as you get higher up in the octaves the distance increases and a lot of the sounds that you're going to like really hear as musical about the filter are going to be around the middle range um, of the filter because if it's all the way open it's basically like having no filter that makes it kind of like a brighter sound it's almost like an eq at that point and this is adjusting kind of the bass where the like the envelope will not go under this point Can you hear how that changes the sound? Okay, and then we covered the Q a little bit, but what the Q does is there's this cutoff point. And you can imagine this this cutoff point right here, where uh, frequencies above this point are getting attenuated. That means like kind of their volume turned down, and the Q. Uh, or the resonance increases this little knee that's right as it turns down into uh, attenuating, it will emphasize that point. So it's another way to <coughs> shape the tone of your synthesizer, and this is the, the core of subtractive synthesis. And you can get some really cool like acid bass sounds when you turn the resonance all the way up. Um, so that's the cutoff and the Q or resonance. And then this controls the amount of the envelope that's going to the filter. So if it's all the way up, the envelope will shoot up to 15k every time. It, it might be happening too quickly for you to see it, but it's actually hitting the 15k up there and then coming back down quickly. But if you want to adjust it so it's only going to like maximum 7.4k. Like maximum of 830 basically. Okay. So those are the three main controls that you'll find on most filters, but the uh, extra feature on this one that's pretty cool is that you can feed the sub oscillator here into the cutoff point as well. So this is kind of like a behind the panel uh, patch addition that's there. And what this is gonna do is actually gonna fade in between, this is the thing I, I had forgot to include up here, um, but it's gonna fade in between th the envelope over here, and then the sub oscillator over here. So you'll see how that sounds. half envelope, half um, uh, uh, the sub oscillator. And you hear it most when the cue is up, but it still makes a difference when you have it down like this. When you combine all of these different factors together, uh, you can get some really crazy sounds. Cranking up the gain here. So it's fun to go and turn the sounds like this, or turn the knobs like this, but it would be nice if we could do that automatically so I didn't have to 
uh, click on things, we could do more things at once. So down there, that, that's where the LFO comes into play. I'm going to break this connection real quick here. Uh, but this this is an LFO, and what it's showing is that there's a triangle, random, and sine. So there's triangle here, and that's the inverse of that triangle, bouncing back and forth. And this is a sine wave here. And they're all going at the same speed. And the random is pulsing once every uh, reset of the wave. And for example, we could do it this. Take this and have the uh, shape of the square wave modified like that. That's if we have one that's the normal and inverted. If we have both of them like this. sounds kind of cool when you have it up like this. It's a real fat sound. But I can also attenuate it so it will only go over a short little area and then now it'll differentiate these two saws even more. Because this one is more like a normal uh, half on half off saw and this is a more reedy, uh, more on, less off saw. Compare that to you. That's all, it's very dissonant. And now this offset will move them. I can move them more towards the middle. That's the, the control for the, the triangle. And you could add some, if you wanted to add some, say, uh, filter cutoff modulation, you could do something like this, where it's slowly, this is sort of like, it will only go from here to here. And then this is where that this here to here starts. So you take this, and then you kind of tack it under there. And that's, that's how you know what range that the modulation is going to go through. But I just want it to uh, basically modulate the bass cutoff for this filter here. different tone to that we can add the random and this you can we can make the like classic sample and hold filter sound and we do that. And 
you've definitely you've heard this on all sorts of um, sci-fi kind of soundtracks. See if, I, if I turn this back down, you can hear the modulation a little more. Basically, if I turn this all the way down, there's no modulation covering the envelope at all. It's all just from this random right here. And this is a mixture of all three, so we have this modulation, this modulation, and then this modulation. So it's three different modulation types. Then we can go ahead and we can add modulation to the cue. Um, you don't really hear it that much. Okay, that's a good one. So that, that's modulating the filter amount with the uh, sine wave here. Just some of the uses, but uh, you know we can we can even can have it mold, uh, uh, going between different shapes too. So so it's modulating not only the shape. Uh, w which wave it is, but the shape of that individual wave too. Let me do this. say uh, we have it going slow like this but I want the LFO to reset from the same point every time I press the keyboard so you see this light that flashes here whenever I press the key well, I can drag that down to here and that will reset the wave see how the LFO it's almost like an, on, an extra envelope Just the kind of action of the envelope. That's slower. This is faster. And then to add an extra layer to it all, we come back down to these, which I skipped over before. This is the individual envelope outputs and their inverted outputs. So I can use that to say morph between between that. So it's just starting. You can't see it because it's going really fast, but it's starting at the triangle and then morphing to square.
because I have this set up like this, it's going to sound like it's going sharp as the note decays. If I want it to sound like it's going flat, I can do it this way. Set these up the opposite. So it almost has like a pitch decay to it. Starts with more, uh, more sub oscillator and it fades out. We get a really cool pitch effect like this. Click you're hearing sometimes is that's the waves resetting when they come all the way down to reset. And you can even use these to modulate um, the attack time. I'm gonna take this off though. have it that's um that's the curvature in a nutshell uh, i guess i you know volume knob obviously going over that uh oh i i totally glossed over these so uh when you have this set like this that means that the keyboard controls on and here i'm pressing the keyboard but it doesn't do anything but uh so you turn that on if i turn this on i can have velocity control and that will basically control the height to which the envelope will go to. So if I have this turned off, it'll always go to 1. But if I have it, the velocity turned on, then it'll go to the height of the gate as it comes in from the keyboard. Now the slur is a little different, where I can um, do this without... <laughs> kind of um, what slur does when it's turned on, if I, have, if I don't let go of a key uh, while, I'm, while I'm holding that down, then it won't re-trigger any of these envelopes, but if I have it turned off, every time I press uh, a key, then it will re-trigger. Regardless if I'm holding another key down, so you can do stuff like this. Whereas with a slur, that'll sound like... Oops. For that too. Cool. So the slew is different, and that's the kind of the change between the notes. So uh, it'll kind of glide between the two. 
set to the maximum of one second in Mississippi. Or maybe a little bit longer. So that's without. Okay, now, now that we know uh, how it all works with the keyboard, we'll actually go out and make a uh, we'll make a, a little, what am I talking about? <laughs> sequencer thing. So it'll play by itself. And so I'm going to add a sequencer. That was just a, a sequencer I have in my favorites here. Uh, I'm going to go to modules, utility, scale quantizer. And I'm going to translate that M into an O. So I'm going to go to module to utility translation and again I said it in other tutorials but I'm gonna oh hey Christian <laughs> I didn't even notice you were there um, so I'm gonna reorder these folders so if you see it oh, oh, whoops if you see it in another form then that would make sense and this all this all is accessible by if you if you tap on the back of the screen of the iPad and you press create that'll come up but where am I going okay I'm gonna go to modules utility translation and then I want to M2O. I'll translate the 0 to 1 signal into a negative 4 to 4, four signal that is more suitable for the octave. Turn that down and then I need a clock. I'm going to get the shift register clock. I'm going to use two of these. I'm going to use this one to modulate that one. And then that there, and then I'm using I'm using this gate and attaching it there, and I'm going to attach this gate to or slower gate like this one to this this one down here. And I'm going to attach this gate to that there. So this is getting like, you can think of this like the arpeggiation sequence, and then this is sort of the bass note that it's playing. Adjust the sound over here a little bit. I just did it kind of spontaneously when I finished this thing. I wanted to make a little tutorial for um, this here, which is the curvature micro. Got that 
sequence going. So what I can do is I can turn this all the way off and it's going to go down to this audio output now. And I'm going to go select like an analog delay here. Effects. Delay. I like this one a lot. And I can actually clock this from here. And then copy and paste so I can make it stereo. I can, if I set these times separate from each other. Now I'm going to make a mix control that'll be able to go to both of these like that and adjust it. Um, ooh, I'll probably set the regeneration control down a little bit. And yeah, why not? I'm going to go to module library, modules, mixer, and go to stereo mixer. This is a nice little, I don't like that output, but um, it's a nice little output where you can you can actually flip the width and set the level. A favor, favorite audio output. I like this little smaller one. I'm just gonna turn that up. seven so it's kind of evolving. This is how you can introduce uh, step skips. And actually I now realize that I didn't pl plug any notes into here.
compare that to this is with the external effects. That's what, that's what that, these are kind of fading out. that sound from just this tiny little synth that had a little extra delay there. I can actually I can take this um, quantizer and I can do well, yeah. Just direct in. This is the pitch that's getting sent to the synthesizer. I can send it to this tune delay line. I think so. So I actually have a little... I'll modulate that. If I have these turned on, it won't. It'll hold that on. I'll turn this off. This is switching between low pass and high pass mode. And then this is switching between untuned and tuned. And then this is clocking the delay. And I can actually have another whole set that turns the sync on and off.
Yeah. Again, with all of this stuff, everything that you're seeing here, all these sequencers, and then this has, this thing in here has an analog modeling filter, and then these have one each. And all of that together is only coming out to about 25% on here, which it would be about equal on an iPhone 7 Plus, and it might be maybe 50% on an iPhone 5. You can play this crazy patch on an iPhone 5. It's gonna sound like this too, you know? inverted sign just because it wouldn't fit on there. But I figured, you know, you can do these kind of backward and forward things with the triangle and then maybe with the sign you could, uh, you know, modulate the uh, detune or something. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I, I've been meaning to update the module library, but yeah. That 8-step sequencer is something I made for like a tutorial forever ago, but, you know, uh, once we get once I get this a little more well done, then I'll go back through the module library and have this included, and then have all the other stuff included. about Odulus is, unlike your modular, <laughs> when you're playing with your Eurac, you can't, sometimes you get this point where, like, just like with drawing or something, you can, like, overwork something. I want to get it back to this kind of, that kind of, like, plucky, fun thing that it was before. I can just press undo until you get back, it gets back to where I want it. Now that it's here, I'll upload this uh, as it is, and you can play around with it. There's already this is already up on the forum for you to play with, and I'll fix this little thing here so it looks a little better. But basically, that's explaining the the sub going into the uh, VCF cutoff there. Uh, but if you guys have any other questions before I go, you can let me know. And uh, I know it was a last minute thing, but it was sort of like I just finished this today, and I was like. You know, I wanted to make a little quick video that I could post on the patch on the forum uh, to show people how it works and everything. So if, if you arrived late, there, I had a whole thing explaining the architecture of the synth behind it and basically walked knob by knob, button by button through everything. So yeah. Like I said, this is the, this is the smaller version of the much larger uh, synthesizer here. This one's a... Where is the I'm running? This one's a fun kind of like pulsing one. 
And as you can see, this is a lot more complex than what's going on in that one. But basically, it's the heart. The microsynthesizer is the heart of this one. But this is meant, right here, is meant to be more as like a full, all-in-one composition station. You can see the sequencers here are doing very similar stuff to how I've been set up down there. This is now sort of like this is a sequencer that's going from an input to several outputs, and then you have several inputs to one output. That's more like a traditional sequencer. It's kind of like the opposite of a sequencer. It's like a sequential switch, almost, or a sequential routing switch. Got all sorts of cool logic equations and stuff. And I've already added a couple things on this one. It's already up to 1.0.2 maybe. So this will this will also run in an iPhone 5. This whole crazy complex patch with all that stuff. And it looks so beautiful on the retina screen. With everything moving. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea behind this one is to, like, this is for people who already understand synthesis and want to go to the next level, like, they maybe, you know, have used, um, you know, a Moog synthesizer where it's an opera function, and then they want to learn how to do patching and stuff and more complex stuff, whereas this, this is more for the, you know, synth beginner, and it's really small and can wrap your head around it. Uh, and it also has a little bit of the semi-modular stuff going on, so you can start to get a hang of that uh, without jumping full hog into something like that. But it's basically... You know. That's a fun one. I like that. So. Alright, well... I'll just go ahead and finish this and upload it for the forum for you guys uh, to check out. Thanks thanks a lot for tuning in, and I'll still have another regular one on Thursday. Uh, I, I don't know, I'll probably do some more stuff with this, to be honest. Uh, maybe with the other synths too. Oh, generative composite? Well, this is sort of uh, generative in the sense that, uh, you know, what's the, you're, I'm responding to Vera right here. So it's generative in the sense that, you know, you have uh, these semi-random things, but they're all kind of controlled from this, you know, main shift register clock divider thing here. And this is the, this sort of like emulates you putting your finger down on the keyboard, and this is like this, the kind of arpeggiator that would be based on this. And then you have two sequencers here that are turning on and off quantizer notes that say like, you know, avoid these notes or play these notes. Then you have here a kind of sequencer that's playing on the tie and the slew. And what's neat is that they're all, this is playing like, um, with, uh, the, with the max at seven where everything else is on eight here. And so it kind of like goes in and out of phase with each other. And then this is the same here with like this emphasis sequencer. So you can use this to skip notes. But, uh, you know, generative can be as simple as, you know, I can take a random, uh, you know, a random note voltage kind of thing and put it into here and then have that going on. But definitely, how about, you know, yeah, like the next time I'll, I'll talk a little more about these different techniques. Like, this is my go-to to, like, it's fun to use all these eight-step sequencers and you can do this really complex sounding stuff that would, this would take forever to, to put into the, the MIDI stream. Yeah, this is, like if you if you were to program this out on MIDI, like it'd be crazy um, to even get something that is, sounds as complex as this. But you know, if if you'd seen me doing that from the beginning, you can see that like literally anyone can do this. All you have to do is just uh, experiment a little bit and turn knobs and try different things, and you'll get your own kind of like generative uh, sequence like this. Um, and what's cool too is if I, I could take this sequencer out of it and basically like add this sequencer to the keyboard node that it's coming into. That's actually some, a function that's on the other keyboard. Actually, I'll save this as it is and I'll show you a couple of the presets I've been working on. And they're gonna be similar presets for this thing. Uh, they won't necessarily have all this stuff around it, but like just there. So this is outside my house, by the way, beautiful view.
of every uh, evening as the clouds roll over the mountains, they kind of billow over the top there. So I've got this whole folder. Uh, you see all these different curvature. These, this is the big synth. Um, all these different examples, and they're like default examples. So like this one is the keyboard arpeggiator. So it's it's just set up in a way where the keyboard is ready to go. So you can play. And it doesn't work like a, at least right now, it doesn't work like a traditional arpeggiator where like every time you press the key it would re-trigger from the first step. That, that's a feature I'm going to add later um, on, but right now it's just continuously running. Uh, so I can that one oh, and I'm gonna have to go I'm gonna revert to last opened close that and then you know go over to this this is a nice sounding one the super saw shape modulation so it's using these LFOs that are over here to modulate the shape and this is actually a patch I think you could you could make with the other one uh, pretty easily but it fakes a super saw sound a little bit because really, you only have uh, two saws going on right now. But because of the uh, modulation, the way it works with these saws, it, it's sort of like what would happen with the super saw, where it's not, it's obviously not pulse width modulation like uh, the square wave is, but it's sort of like, you know, over here is um, un unmodulated, and over here is like an octave up. And, you know, you just have to see it on the, the scope to see it, but we've got it another time. But. If you have this modulation plus the detune, there's a pretty convincing super saw that sounds like, you know, seven saws, that kind of thing. Uh, and then, so th there's a whole like zip folder that's actually on online right now that you can download that's on the forum. Um, you know, it shows you how to do like basic effects, like here's a chorus, a chorus effect. And you can combine these things with the different patches uh, as you get to know the techniques. I see. Uh, catch up with that just workflow. Sure. Um, well, you know, the main difference between Max and Audulus is that, you know, Max is top down and Audulus is left right. And to me, that always seemed more intuitive. That, I mean, you read that way. Like, why wouldn't you design something that way? It seems like, you know, having that, that flow from top to bottom. And it's also, it's a little more, this looks like a real modular. E even on the inside, it still looks like. You know you're connecting modules together like this, but um, you know any questions you have about how to you know work in Audulus, it, part of it you'll just pick up, especially if you're if you're used to Max and PD. Um, you can just watch me do things and explain them as I as I go along. I don't know if you were here since the beginning of the live stream, but uh, you know you can go to one of the building live streams where I build something and you can see how uh, I'm you know creating something like this from scratch. Uh, but okay, this is the chorus. And then I have this pulled up here with these different parameters, so that's, you're not kind of like wondering which which ones are which. That's chorus. Um, let me see. But another fun one is like, uh, let's see. Yeah, this is. Well, let's do, let's just do the complex envelope, quad envelope. So there are four envelopes in this version. You have the two basic ones that are in the other ones, and then these also have beginning and end of cycle uh, gates. But there are also two envelopes down here, and so I have the uh, gate as it's coming out. Uh, 
to trigger these two envelopes as it's playing. So this one is controlling. Yeah, that's. So you're getting the filter. Actually, this one should be doing something. Why doesn't? Maybe I. Yeah. yeah, there we go. I guess I took that connection off on accident. So, you know, this this shows a more complex envelope shape that you can't just have with an ADSR. So I, when I press the key, it detunes this oscillator and then let it, lets it retune back up. It changes the shape a little bit. And then the envelope goes through its cycle. And as it does, it triggers this other, it triggers as it's releasing with the VCA right there it'll trigger this envelope, which is going up here to the cutoff. So it'll, until I let go, it won't do anything. Yep. So you can see why I'm really excited about the potentials for the synth and getting it into the hands of people, especially when they start making their own, you know, kind of quote unquote presets. You can see on here, there's the type default name and then the author. Uh, and eventually, you know, Taylor and I were talking today about presets and how we're going to do them. And it might be a little complicated with these semi-modulars. It might not, we might not be able to design a good way to save these um, patch cables. Uh, I won't go into why, but it's it's a complex problem. Uh, but basically, we will be able to save all of the knob and button states really easily, and you'll be able to like right click and it'll be like presets, and there'll be a little preset window that you can go up into, or when you tap on it, there'll be a little in the context menu that goes above the patch, be presets, and you can navigate them. You'll be able to copy and paste them and send them. It's like if you if you brought this up and you made your own presets and you wanted to share them with a friend, you'd just make sure that they were using the same version that, uh, of the synthesizer you're using and they could copy those presets over to yours. And there's a whole forum thread right now that's asking for your input on what uh, you'd like to see out of the preset uh, module type stuff. Uh, could be some pretty cool possibilities there. But we're always interested in your input and your feature requests. so. You know, there's a whole section on the forum now that you can you can go there and, and uh, feature request anything. So this has actually been a feature request for a long time, is having a synthesizer that you can just pull up and play with uh, without having to uh, patch a bunch of things. Um, I'll, go, I'll just go through one more. Um, let's see. And tape purple is interesting. So what this is doing is it's got some... So these are the FM inputs here. So this is the, it's basically creating uh, this signal here that's getting sent to the oscillator and uh, wiggling the pitch. So this is, it's an interesting effect because I have another one where it modulates the delay line and it has a different different uh, sound to it. But what it's doing is it's, uh, you have a sample and hold that is modifying both of the speeds of the slow and fast, the wow and flutter. And the flux is the like amount of travel between uh, the randomness. And when you add these together, you get this complex, you know, FMing signal, where it's basically a slow and a fast triangle on top of each other, and that kind of simulates a tape warble vibrato. Synth voices? You talk. Oh, there's um, there's a standalone synthesizer, uh, uh, subcategory there. So I think that would cover the synth voices. That's where this thing is. Um, it's in Oops. One, two. So 
so there's, <laughs> there's a end here. But uh, if you go down to patches, standalone synthesizers, and then people could put their own in here. That'd be really fun if more people could make uh, other ones their own little standalones. I know people have them too. I've seen them on on Instagram. People have uh, their own standalone synthesizers that they made. It'd be awesome if they could post them here uh, as well. So, anyway. That's it for today. Uh, I'll just end on noting uh, you guys have been so great. I'm actually, I'll actually show you um, on the forum. Uh, I've made this topic here, the Oculus Five Star Reviews, and you can see just how many we, we've gotten. And this isn't even like nearly half of them, uh, all these five star reviews over, over the years. This is only just for, I've, I've only been posting the ones for 3.0, or uh, Oculus 3 for right now. But you know, whenever there's a new one, I'll post it on here. But basically, you know, explaining up here why uh, five-star reviews in the iOS and Mac stores help. Just in the last like week or two, we've had a big boost in sales, and it's probably. I mean, we can't definitely transit track it down to this, but it, this definitely doesn't hurt. Having those five-star reviews, uh, we have more right now than we've had in a long time at once, and then that makes the app like shoot up the charts, and then that means more people buy it. Uh, more people buy it, we get more money, we get more money, we can pay more people to work on more uh, features at once. So like Taylor is not just doing it all by himself. And then Odulus becomes bigger and better, and it's kind of this self-feeding cycle. And it's a really, really, if you love Odulus, if you're here right now, um, this is the easiest thing you can do to help get your feature request you know, met or something, is, is you know, giving us the five-star reviews. And we're about to release a fix for the iOS 11. Right now, people who are on the iOS 11 beta can't use Odulus, but um, Taylor seems to have tracked down what the problem was and fixed it. And so that's about to be released, which means when we release that, all of the, the reviews that are up there will get kind of cleared out. They won't, they won't be erased, but they'll kind of be pushed off the front page of that. So if you go in when you see a new version that comes out, if you go in and update your, inter your, your review just by like changing a few words here or there, um, it will show back up uh, on, on the page again, and that helps so much. Uh, so if you, if you like these, uh, if you enjoy these tutorials, that can be an awesome way that you can like give back. All right, thanks a lot for hanging out, and uh, let me know in the forum. I'll, pat I'll post this uh, other patch uh, that I had up here onto the forum and post this live stream up there and you can ask any follow-up questions there and again i'm going to have another live stream on thursday uh this is just a bonus one for the week so oh the the ios 11 bug was just that it didn't work it, you couldn't hear um what was going on i mean maybe taylor can explain uh exactly what was going on there but uh people were loading it and they just couldn't hear any sound which is typical and you know you should always know that like Odulus will always work on the current iOS, uh, but it won't necessarily work on really old iOSs or um, betas of new ones. And, and I mean, that's typical, like is that's why it's a beta. So always beware before you update to beta. We appreciate the people who update to beta because then you can tell us if it's working or not. Um, but, uh, you know, just be aware that it might not always work on one of these, these big betas out there. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, and ha have a good night, and I'll see you on the forum. Appreciate it.